Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Professor Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College. You see behind me the Geological Sciences Building at UT El Paso. I spent two years of my life here, 1965 to 67, in the basement of this building when it was the library for this university. It was then known as Texas Western College. I wrote my master's thesis in going through the document section of this library and I wrote it on slavery and how the Bible was used in Congress and they would open up the Bible and say why slavery was good. God intended it. So when I came here and was working on my master's, I was interested in civil rights and civil liberties. I graduated from Wayland Baptist College in 1961 and that college was the first college in Texas, four-year school, to desegregate voluntarily and let blacks in. A woman who was a school teacher in that area, uh, she enrolled and took a summer class to enhance her educational certification. When I came here, ended up at this university and found out when I arrived that uh, a woman named Thelma White had wanted to come to school here and she was kept out because the state of Texas did not blacks to attend college classes with whites. And so the NAACP and other organizations went into court and made it possible for her to enroll in the school. Ironically, she went off to another school and finished there because of the fight that was going on. But later, three of her children attended this university, a great university. So now I invite you to join me in going into the side of this building and having a special visit with a guest that's been on my show before, but never in this particular location. So let's go inside and have a conversation. Well, I told you a few moments ago in front of this building, the geologic sciences at UT El Paso, that I had a very special guest on the show today. Instead of being our studio at EPCC, we are here in the geologic sciences building with the president of the University of Texas at El Paso, Dr. Diana Natalicio. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You've been on this program before, several years ago. I have, and I thank you for inviting me back. Well, one reason I was interested in doing the show this year, this is the early part of 2016, and this is the 50th anniversary of the great basketball championship, and the team from here from that time, when it was called Texas Western College, named to the, oh, the whole team, named to the National Basketball Hall of Fame. That's right, and we're very, very proud of that. We're the only Texas University to have ever won the men's basketball championship. That's great. And then two years ago, you had the 100th anniversary of this university. We did. We're getting very good at celebrating anniversaries. <laughs> we, we do that now with great regularity. We try to spot a new important date, and we arrange for a celebration. Now, we haven't been around that long, but I've been associated with this school since 1964 when I took some education classes in the summer. And then I did a master's degree here uh, in 1965 to 67. Mm -hmm. And they changed the name of the school during that particular That's period right. of time. Let's see, I got one of the early master's degrees. Uh, what kind of changes have you seen? Let's talk about access and excellence and diversity coming into this school because I can remember when the population was very different than it is now here at the university. Well for sure and I came here in 1971 as a faculty member and it's certainly a different university today than it was then too. Um, I think in, in past times 50 years ago, um, 25 years ago even, um, we weren't as focused as we are today on educating the entire population of this region. Mm -hmm. We weren't as aggressive about encouraging young people to think about the importance of a university degree in terms of their life opportunities. Um, we welcomed those students who applied and wanted to study here, but we didn't really um, seek out students and try to encourage them in the way we do now because in today's world, in the 21st century, without a university degree, it's going to be very, very difficult to have the kind of life, quality of life, that um, 
you would otherwise be able to aspire to with a degree. And so we know that there is a lot of talent in this community that's been squandered through the years because there just wasn't the idea that there were opportunities for many of these young people. And so we've been very uh, aggressive in outreach to the community together with the community college because both of us, I think, recognize the importance of creating those opportunities. Well, this past December, you had a commentary in the El Paso Times, and you talked about some of this. And I noticed that you said something about early childhood education. I'm a strong supporter of that because that's where the foundation is. They get that basic language and excitement about learning, and they can lose that pretty quickly in the early grades. And then you talked about uh, teaming up with a couple of elementary schools here and things of that nature. And then, of course, teaming up with some of the high schools, including early college high schools through the community college. Uh, tell us about that. Um, what's your vision about dealing with that? Well, I, I think one of the, when I became president of UTEP, one of the things that struck me um, as most salient about us is that there's one university, one community college, and 12 school districts in El Paso County. And we're a closed circle, really, in terms of creating opportunities for people in this region. We produce teachers, the schools produce graduates who become our students, and so the way in which we work together is critical. We stand on the shoulders of the K-12 sector, our colleagues there, teachers, principals, counselors, everybody in, in the K-12 area, and on the shoulders of our colleagues at the community college, like you, who help prepare students to come onto UTEP and be successful when they come. So we, we have made a real effort to look like the community from which we draw nearly 90% of our students. That is, demographically, we ought to mirror the ethnicity, the socioeconomic characteristics, and so on, of the population of the region. As a public university, that's our responsibility. We should serve everyone, not just those who live closer to the campus or those who might be um, graduating from high schools that are nearby with which we might have relationships, but students in Clint and students in Fabens and all over this region, there's talent everywhere. That's what's so exciting. It crosses all boundaries. And we're here to help that talent develop and to create opportunities for those young people then uh, to lead productive and satisfying lives. Well, my first acquaintance really to the educational system here was in the 1960s, early 60s. My wife, Shanna, had gone to Esalita High School, S. Garrity Elementary, Esalita mm -hmm. High School and so on. And so I ended up here taking some education courses in 1964. It seemed to me at that time this was mainly a, a liberal arts school and a teacher preparation school. Mm -hmm. I didn't, it had been a, started off as a mining school, mm -hmm. but it seemed like it had become a liberal arts school and teacher preparation school. And now you're pushing very strongly, I know, from our previous conversations, research. Tell us about this and opening doors into research. Well, I think actually in the 60s, um, it may not have been as obvious, but we were continuing to do a lot of work in engineering at that time. Oh, so yes. right. liberal arts, engineering, and teacher preparation, I think those would have been probably the key areas of focus. Research has come into the picture uh, very strongly over the past 25 years or so because research represented our strategy to ensure that we achieve both access and excellence. So what that means is that it's not sufficient just to create opportunities, access, affordability, so that students can come into the university, but that the degree that they earn is going to enable them to be competitive with anybody from anywhere. And that's excellence, that's quality. And so in order to achieve that quality, you have to have competitive faculty, you've got to have great facilities, you've got to be able to offer students at UTEP the same sort of experiences that more affluent students in more prestigious universities and other settings take for granted. We've got to create that experience here. Our students have to be able to get some kind of international global experience. They have to be able to work in research labs so that they know what that's like. So if they want to go on to graduate school or they want to get a job with a pharmaceutical company or something like that, they've had those experiences so their confidence is high. And that's one of the things we've really worked hard on. And so research has been a strategy to promote a climate 
of excellence on the campus, to have people who are working actively on scientific breakthroughs of various kinds and who create jobs in those laboratories for undergraduate students who all, for the most part, have to work anyway. But working in their laboratories on campus means that they're learning while they're earning and they're becoming um, inspired by the science that goes on in those laboratories or engineering mm -hmm. and excited about that. And that means that they're probably going to think about graduate school or opportunities that otherwise they wouldn't have come to us with. Uh, for years, uh, the lower income population of El Paso was being told by many of their relatives and friends, no need to go into school. Just get out, go get a job, go get a job. But as time went on, they began to realize the significance of this. And as you and I tell our students, we're in a globalized economy. We're competing with people all over the world for these jobs and for expertise in these fields. Now, another thought comes to mind that we're right here on the border with Mexico, the biggest urban area on the border with Mexico. And congratulations, not long ago, you were honored by the Mexican government with their highest civilian honor for someone outside of their it's nation. Deeply honored. Yes, that's great. And so you've seen this, relate this urban population and education in a bilingual society and the significance of that? Well, I think U UTEP is actually unique nationally. I mean, many institutions claim uniqueness, but no. I think UTEP really is unusual. We're unusual in terms of the ethnic demographic of our student population, our location on the border, and the opportunities that we offer uh, because of the, the model that we've developed for higher education, public higher education in the 21st century. What we're trying very hard to do is to ensure um, that young people who come to us and faculty who work with us have an opportunity to capitalize on all that this region has to offer. And the border, of course, is part of that. I mean, there aren't universities anywhere that are located in a binational metropolitan area of this size with the opportunities that that offers. And so we're educating Mexican students in larger numbers than any other university in the United States. Um, we are doing uh, joint projects with universities in Ciudad Juarez and trying very hard to um, capitalize on the opportunities that present themselves. And we are also working very closely with a group of um, researchers on issues of common interest in the region, such as water, for example. Water crosses the international boundary. Water belongs to all of us, whether it's in New Mexico, Texas, or Chihuahua. And so those kinds of issues we try very hard to develop um, collaborations on because those perspectives, those binational perspectives, are extremely important. I've taught on this border for 50 years, I guess, and uh, I've noticed, I, I love this culture, I love the border culture, I love the fact that we have a Native American population, we have Hispanic population, we also have the military population. Mm -hmm. Tell us about UTEP's relationship to the military. Well, it's an outstanding relationship. We've had an Army ROTC program forever, a uh, long, long time, and it's been a very successful program. Um, many young people, young men and women, have been commissioned and have gone on to great careers in the military and that's a wonderful opportunity for them. Um, we also have worked very closely with uh, Fort Bliss to encourage young people um, on the base to pursue their degrees and their education. We've worked with veterans for a long time on, on their educational opportunities. And most recently, we established a military student center, a st military student success center, yes. which um, is a one-stop shop for military affiliated students on our campus. It provides them with opportunities to seek information, advice, um, spend time with others um, who share similar issues um, that, uh, you know, trying to balance life and, and uh, studies and that sort of thing. And so it's been a very productive, very, very productive uh, center on our campus. Okay, so we've covered some of the basic highlights of, of all of these things. Tell us a little bit about your personal experiences and highlights of your career here. That's a long time. 
if you've been Well, I, you know, I found a place that I liked and I decided to stay. It's unusual, I realize. In higher education, um, most people move out to move up. And I was really committed to the idea that um, I felt I had something to contribute to the to the region. I think that I understood some things very, very well uh, about public higher education and its impact potential on this region. Um, and I felt that we had an opportunity to do something really important here to serve as a model for how you could achieve both access and excellence and create opportunities for people uh, for whom higher education has had not been available in the past. Right. And so um, I consider myself very privileged to have been able to spend as many years as I have working in a single setting, creating a vision, developing a mission, executing that mission, and then living with the consequences of decisions that you make because you have to then, of course, um, tweak decisions um, because you didn't know everything before you started and try to, try to improve um, every single day just a little bit. And so it's been a very exciting run. We've had a great team. Um, you don't do anything alone, none of us. And we have a tremendously committed group of people on this campus who give very generously of their expertise and their time. And they, they really love the idea of creating opportunities for young people. I think deep down, most of us who get into education do. I think we love the idea of having an impact. And I think at UTEP, you feel that every single day. And of course, um, you especially feel it on uh, celebratory occasions like graduation when you realize just the power of that, you know, the number of graduates and the impact not only on the individuals, but on the whole community. Well, I followed your career over all these years in the media, especially, and personally with you once in a while. Uh, I noticed that you are kind of an astute academic politician that you've had to interact with these politicians in Washington, D.C., and in Austin, and even locally, and getting funding for the institution. Tell us about your experience with that. And from my political science perspective, how did you deal with that? Well, I think you learn, uh, it's kind of on-the-job training, um, um, but what you do learn is that if you have passion about what you're doing, and if you <clears throat> present that passion in a logical way, <clears throat> excuse me, mm -hmm. you can, if you're persevering with the story and you don't allow yourself to be defeated by early setbacks, you keep, if you, if you believe that what you're doing is important and that it has potential impact, you have real passion about it, and you're not willing to allow yourself to be defeated quickly or easily, you're tenacious, um, I think you can succeed. It takes time, it takes patience. And one of the things that I think a lot of us don't have in the political process is sufficient patience to see things through. So recently, for example, last legislative session, we got a pharmacy program uh, funded that we'd been working on for a decade. And we never thought um, that it would finally get funded, but it did. And um, we never gave up. We kept thinking, okay, maybe there's a chance. And sure enough, this last session, it, it worked. Um, and so now we're able to bring a full pharmacy doctoral program to El Paso, establish a pharmacy school. And um, that was something that I think the odds were not real good, but somehow, because we were tenacious um, and patient, uh, we finally outlasted them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good record. Yeah. Uh, uh, let, me, let me ask you then this in that particular respect. Which was one of the hardest things for you to accomplish to get done? In all these years here, I remember when I started here, there were very few masters programs, there were some. Uh, the political science one started in 1965, I think, when I started working on it. But they didn't have very many doctorates. Were any of those doctorates that you finally got approved especially hard to get? I think um, the first one was the hard one um, because we had been told that we would not 
have more than one doctoral program, which we already had. So it was number two, but it was the first one that we worked on. Mm -hmm. The first one was approved in the 1970s. That was a geology doctoral program. Right. And once we got that one, we were informed that that would be it, that there wouldn't be any more. And so trying to get number two, which was the first one that we worked on, um, was quite daunting. And there were many naysayers, many people who said, oh, that's never going to happen, you know. But you can't, you can't walk in with that attitude. You've got to walk in with the attitude that this is going to happen, and we're going to make it happen, and we just have to figure out the way. And um, so the first doctoral program after the one in geology was el electrical and computer engineering. It was extremely strong proposal. We fussed over it and wrote and rewrote and so on, and then worked very, very hard to make the case. Um, and we were fortunate because, um, as you may recall, your, your uh, memory on history is very good, that there was a lawsuit that was brought by uh, LULAC and MALDEF against the state of Texas, which created a context that had nothing to do with us in particular at UTEP, but it was a, a lawsuit that alleged that the investment in graduate education in the state of Texas was disparate uh, between the border region and the Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex. And that lawsuit created conditions that were conducive to our getting some traction on this idea that we were going to have more than one doctoral program. And sure enough, it, uh, I think it tipped the scales. I think we were very persuasive, but I think that the, the um, lawsuit certainly did create a climate where they thought twice about turning us down. Right. Well, they pointed out that a lot of the oil money and the revenue coming for schooling and higher education in Texas came from West Texas. That's right. That's but it right. was being spent in the other part of the state. Exactly. So that was a strong case exactly. that they built there. Yeah. We have just a few minutes uh, left. Any other observations you'd like to make about this great institution? Well, I, I'm very, very pleased at the progress that we've made at UTEP over the past 27 years uh, during the time I've been president. Um, and we owe it all to a team of people who work very, very hard uh, to achieve goals. It's never easy when resources are limited, as you know. And so we've had to do more with less uh, for a long, long time, and we're pretty good at that now. Um, we take nothing for granted. Our students don't take anything for granted, and none of us do either. Uh, I think we have a very committed group of people, faculty and staff, um, who understand that we have to work for what we get. Um, but they also understand um, that we can be as successful and as competitive as anybody else, uh, even though they may have more resources. Um, so I think there's great satisfaction to be derived from um, being successful at doing what other people consider to be impossible. When you were teaching, did you ever visualize that you would move into administration? Not really. I mean, when I first became uh, a faculty member here, I had no intention of being an administrator. I came as a faculty member. I loved teaching. I loved my classes. Um, and I still see some of my former students from time to time. And I always enjoy remembering uh, being in the classroom. Um, but I kind of backed into it, as many of us do. Um, I was asked to become a department chair and then um, associate dean and dean of liberal arts and kind of one thing led to another. Um, but I enjoy administration primarily because I derive a lot of vicarious pleasure from other people's accomplishments. It doesn't have to be mine. I, I get as much joy from someone else um, succeeding at something as I do myself. And so I, I can have every single day with 23,000 students and 4,000 faculty and staff, somebody succeeding every single day. So I got a <laughs> smile on my face, that's for sure. Oh, there's no doubt about that. Well, it's so wonderful to be able to visit with you again. And we need to do this again in updates from time to time. Anytime you're ready, <laughs> I'd be happy to. Okay. Who inspired you to get into the field of education? Let's go back many years then before you started teaching here. Well. When I was very small growing up in St. Louis, I wanted to be a teacher, a uh, teacher like the teachers that I was taught by in my elementary school, let's mm -hmm. say. I admired my teachers. I liked them. I liked reading. I liked my teachers and so on. I liked school. 
Um, high school was a totally different story. I got kind of turned off to education. Um, and um, that was because I went to a public high school that set very low expectations for its students. We were blue collar kids and they just assumed that all of the boys would become apprentices in the unions at Anheuser-Busch, Monsanto and all the big companies in St. Louis in the trades, you know, electricians, carpenters, plumbers and so on. And the girls would marry them and that was kind of what they were preparing us to do. I, I studied typing and shorthand in high school, so I, I had a kind of secretarial studies <laughs> um, uh, trajectory. And I, I ended up working at a job as a switchboard operator in a large manufacturing company in St. Louis when I graduated from high school. It took me only two months of that job to realize that that was not going to be my future. I mean, being Lily Tomlin of Nordberg Manufacturing was not going to be it. My and wife did that for a period of time right here in El Paso. And it was um, then quite a uh, challenge for me to think about, okay, now, wh now what? I mean, uh, this, is, this is definitely not it. <laughs> People were nice and so on, but it was boring. And so I went to St. Louis University to ask how I could register, and they were um, very, very supportive. They knew that my background was not as strong as it needed to be because I'd be competing with boys from St. Louis University Prep School. Well, this gets and to the issue of diversity again. It used to be men, 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 right. men, and then women that's began right. to get into these fields. Uh, that's exactly right. And so I had to work really, really hard at St. Louis University. I had a half-time job as a secretary, so the skills helped. I mm -hmm. typed fast, right. but um, I studied I went to classes in the morning, went to work in the afternoon, and then studied nonstop every night and all weekend because I was I was really far behind my my peers. Um, but gradually I caught up, and by the time I completed my degree, I I was in the honors program and everything was back on track mm -hmm. educationally. Um, and I ended up actually at um, I ended up getting a Fulbright to Brazil, uh, which was really a big deal because I'd never been on an airplane and all of the rest of that so that was all quite special and and I learned to live in another place and learned another language and all that and then I was recruited to UT Austin by the chairman of Spanish and Portuguese to teach Portuguese oh, okay. in Austin and that's how I got into uh, the teaching game um, as a teaching assistant at University of Texas at Austin and after that then um, you know I, I loved I loved doing that and went on to get my doctorate at Austin and so on. Well, this story is not over. You still have goals to achieve. <laughs> many, many. Our business is not done, for and, sure. And, and I know that some that will be watching this program are inspired by what you have done here and the legacy that you have left for this university. Thank you for what you have done, and thanks for being on my show again. Well, thanks for the invitation. I'm always happy to be here. Good. And that's another program, I think a very interesting program called Perspectives El Paso. We'll see you in the future. So now you have seen our little conversation with Dr. Natalicio. This is the second time in about eight years or so that we've had this conversation with her. So you keep tuning in to Perspectives El Paso and see who I might have on next time. Thanks for watching.